All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming along. Um, it'd be great to keep it really informal. And uh, so, please, at any time, let's make it um, make it a two-way thing. Uh, I've been asked to speak <laughs> on equipping the saints for ministry, or at least that's the uh, the the topic of the um, the workshop. Uh, I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, to be honest, uh, except that it sounds very religious, um, and I don't like religion. Uh, in fact, I hate religion. Uh, religion enslaves more people than human trafficking does. And um, with, a, with a, a small group, well, a group uh, of this size, I can go even further and say that, from my experience, Christianity, as a religious system, does not work. It's no different to any other religious system. But a relationship with Jesus Christ is a is another thing entirely. Uh, so. Equipping the saints for ministry. Ministry, um, by definition, is a a vocation of religion. So equipping people to uh, live out a, a religious vocation is something I don't really want to do. Um, to my mind, there is only one, one reason to uh, uh, to be to be here uh, and to, and to explore what this I think hope this topic is about, and it's um. Uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. It is for freedom that uh, that uh, He set us all free, and and therefore, um, uh, I think what I pre- would prefer to focus on instead of the religious version of e- equipping the saints for ministry is uh, is something a bit more authentic to me, which is um, how to go, uh, how to rest in, and live out more authentically what it means to be free. To live out the freedom that Christ has set us free for, um, and uh, if the best definition I've ever heard of, of of freedom is that freedom is an incremental process inside a relationship with Jesus Christ. That it's an incremental process. Freedom is an incremental process inside a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, I come back to the word I used in the other uh, session which is um, the most the most the most powerful uh, weapon in uh, in living out this freedom that I have uh, seen and heard of is um, assurance and I come back to Baxter Kruger's quote that there is more crime stopping power uh, as far as tear fund and invader are concerned more more power to effectively combat modern-day slavery and and human trafficking. More crime-stopping power, more culture-transforming, value-begetting power in one person who knows the truth, who knows what God the Father has made of her, who has assurance running through her veins, than a thousand committee-generated kingdom uh, machines. Um, so where does this assurance come from, and 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 how do we get this assurance? Uh, you know, the Christian verbiage would say that it's up to us that we have to uh, um, press into God. You know, depending on what denom- denomination you come from, um, you know, we've got to pursue the things of God and press into God. And and if the, if there's something wrong between there's something not going right in your life, it's because you are not enough. You're not doing something right, you're not following the formula, you're not pressing in, and I think that's BS. <laughs> and uh, when I had um, spent many years pressing in, pursuing, uh, giving everything that I possibly had, and it completely destroyed uh, everything that I that I was and and um, uh, came to the end of myself. I discovered that assurance comes um, from an unlikely place, and it's called rest. 
And uh, again, I'm no theologian, but to my mind, um, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And, and throughout Scripture, there's many, many references to that freedom being described as a place of rest. Uh, that you are enough. You know, how are we possibly supposed to reach out, uh, equip anybody if in our core we do not know that we are enough, just as we are, and that we matter? And that it's not that we press into him and pursue him, it's that he pursues us. And because he pursues us, we can rest, because it's not up to us. He pursues us, and we we turn and face him for sure, and we receive it. Um, but uh, we do so in the knowledge that that we are enough. Um, so I suppose if uh, if there's any equipping of the saints uh, to be done, uh, from my experience at least, it begins with um, uh, going deeper into freedom. Begins with assurance and resting in the knowledge that in your core. Uh, You are loved. Again, easy to say. Um, But in your core that you are enough. Um, Again, the the image I think think of that's been most helpful for me is is light shining in the darkness. You know, it's not something that you have to strive uh, to do. You you turn the light on, you light a candle or a a flashlight or um, whatever, and the light is... And uh, and more than that, those who are attracted to the light are drawn to it like a magnet. So again, it's a very different. Um, someone described it as uh, you know how how good are you at pushing a rope, a rope hanging from the ceiling, um, or not even from the ceiling, but you know the, a lot of our ministry, our equipping the saints, is like pushing rope. Um, you, you can only pull rope. And likewise, I, I believe we're invited to, to rest in his abundance and the knowledge that we are enough and to shine so that we act as a magnet. Uh, I give the example of, of um, some of Tia Fund's uh, aftercare partners. Um, Tia Fund partners with uh, Hagar uh, in Cambodia. And um, the youngest girls that I've carried out of a brothel, as I said, were, were five and six years old at the time, and uh, and it was Hagar was the organisation where, where they ended up. Um, Tia Fund also partners with Share and Care, another aftercare group in Nepal. And in every case, uh, the women and children in those places are so betrayed. Uh, and depending on how long they've been enslaved, have come to identify their, their value as what someone will buy them for, and again, in, in the very worst cases, they they see the the only uh, the uh, the only value they can see in themselves is through the eyes of of a man and what he will pay for them, and and uh, uh, and so you can imagine again the the challenge for aftercare organisations, uh, Tier Funds partners, Hagar, Share and Care, uh, Zoe is another one we work with in Thailand. The challenge for these organisations is. Um, uh, you know, that's something you can't push. Um, you can only you can only shine in the knowledge that... Uh, you can only be in the knowledge that uh, you are free, you are enough, you are loved, and, uh, and act as a magnet, because when the time is right, whenever that time is for those women and children, only then will they tentatively take a step toward the light. Many of them don't, and that's the tragedy, the trauma that we all work with is many of them don't, and they, uh, in many cases, the, the older women in particular who have been in the sex industry for years, you know, they go back to it. Even though they were trafficked, drugged, kidnapped, raped, enslaved. Uh, even more tragic is, um, in, in many of the communities I know in Nepal where sharing care works, is um, uh, they can't go back home even though they were drugged, raped, kidnapped and sold, they can't go back home because of the, the stigma, the shame. Uh, even into Christian, in fact in some cases, especially into Christian communities who will not have them back because of the stigma associated with their work in prostitution or their contamination. Again, which is why I say, um, you know, equipping the saints and all that religious stuff is, is to me it's BS. 
uh, it comes from deep assurance um, that you are enough, that in Christ you are face to face, the farm you to be, and that he wraps his arms around you and pursues you with affection. And it's only as those aftercare groups uh, communicate that by who they are uh, that some of these women and children um, turn toward the light and take the risk of, of trusting again. Uh, so rest is the first way. Um, unexpectedly for me, you know, who was always Mr. Serious, um, you know, my, my heroes are James Bond and Jason Bourne. Uh, play. Uh, the, the invitation to play. That um, we take ourselves very seriously. <laughs> and religious people especially... Uh, take ourselves very seriously. And when you think about it, if if you start to take on that religious stuff and, and you know, believe the subtle insidious lies that God wants to use you as opposed to just wanting to love you uh, and that he wants to use you because, you know, he wants to build his kingdom and there's a massive... Anyway, this massive... And then you add sex trafficking and, and modern-day slavery on top of that... Um, and uh, I hear um, the invitation of the Spirit whose fruit is love and joy and peace, patience and kindness and goodness. And you just have this playground kind of, um, you know, I, uh, as I said, um, uh, in this brothel in Cambodia uh, where I was, um, one of my first uh, first missions was, was going into a room and there was two 16-year-old girls who were offered to me and uh, based on the intelligence I'd seen, I said, actually, I'm looking for something a bit different. Thank you anyway, and went to leave. And the man said, oh, no, wait, wait. Uh, I know what you want. And he left the room, and he came back in with two uh, six-year-old girls. And they had pigtails in their hair, and they had teddy bears on their shirts. And he said, for 30 US dollars, you can do whatever you want to these girls for one hour. Um, but we certainly, I, I said, uh, in that particular situation, I was thankful for my police experience because I saw that through the eyes of, a, of an investigator and I was thrilled because that was, I was, had a covert camera in my shirt, I was recording the whole thing and so for me this is fantastic, this is, I'm gathering really damning evidence, there's no way he can say later that he thought they were 18. Uh, so th I'm gathering a crime, evidence of a crime that he can be prosecuted with that will hopefully lead to the rescue and so I perpetuated that and then said have you got any more? children like this, I've got some clients that would love kids like this and, and over the next uh, three weeks I was introduced to nearly 50 children in that one village between 6 and 12 years old being sold every day to men from Australia, US, Canada, Europe, Asia and New Zealand. Um, and as an aside, I didn't answer that question fully this morning in the main uh, and I, I did want to clarify that it's actually not pedophiles who are the, who are the problem, uh, it's, it's men. Um, between 50 and 80 percent of men in church are enslaved to pornography. Uh, it's it's men. It's gender inequality. It's corporate. Um, uh, if anything, it's corporate pedophilia. Um, anyway, it's it's a massive uh, cultural issue. Um, we, we, we were able to mount a, a rescue operation, and um, we were able to rescue some of those children. Uh, and as I say, the partners, um, uh, Tier Fund's partners today work really hard with, with some of those girls that, uh, that I was able to have the honour of, of carrying out of the, of the brothel. But there were many, many more that I met who were not rescued. And, um, and essentially, over the four-year period, I failed far more than I, uh, than I had success. And what do you do with that? You know, uh, someone gave me a Mother Teresa quote during that time and said, God's called you, God's not called you to be six successful, just faithful. And I thought, yeah, that's fine for you to say. You're not the little guy because I didn't get you out. You know, I mean, albeit it's true, but, or there's truth in it. But what do you, what do you, uh, except that you come to that place where, um, as the scripture says, Old Testament, even though it is, the battle is the Lord's. But essentially, it's his battle, that it is his fight. Um, we have the, the amazing invitation to participate 
uh, with him in it. But as I said in the main session, um, if we don't see it as actually this is his battle, he's already won the war. Uh, there's nothing that can take us out of his hand. And in some cases, um, there's nothing that can take these little ones out of his hand either. It's just that at the moment, they're enslaved and, and we get the chance with him to participate uh, or in your own in your own lives, you know, we don't, we don't need to step outside this room. Uh, we all have battles going on. There's all stuff that the tentacles of which reach out to enslave and condemn. Uh, the voice of the accuser and the enemy is constant. Um, but just just uh, again coming back to that assurance, that place there is only one place in Christ, face to face with the Father. Uh, that is the only place for me where I've found truth, freedom, wholeness, and assurance that allows me and tear fund colleagues to, to go out into those dark places knowing that it's not up to us. We do the absolute best we can, um, but we are not, as I said, plan God's plan A. Uh, Jesus is his plan A through Z, uh, and we're invited to participate in, in, in part of that. Uh, there's a great passage in, in the message where it says, Are you tired? Worn out? burned out on religion. And Jesus says, come to me. Learn from me. Rest in me. You know, hang out and play with me and I will teach you how to live freely and lightly inside the unforced rhythms of grace. So uh, for me, assurance comes from from rest and from uh, play and and delight would be the third area that I'm learning to uh, to explore in the face of um, evil. Uh, you know, go right back to the psalmist to uh, David. I, he said, "I delight um, in you. I delight to do what you've asked me to do. That it's actually delightful." that it feeds my soul. Again, just those words um, of um, uh, intimate affection, that I am enough just as I am, that I matter, that I am free, that I have complete assurance running through my veins, and therefore I can give you, I can equip, I can reach out, I can I can empower because I'm going to give you the most amazing gift I can possibly give you uh, and that's me. And if you're wrestling with that right now as I say that, um, it's because assurance is not running through your veins. But And don't take my word for it. Go back to him and, uh, and ask, you know, in the spirit... Um, Really? Other-centred self-giving? Uh, Christ in me, in, in partnership with him, giving um, giving all that you are. I mean, as Kiwis, we struggle with that for a start, you know, the whole tall poppy thing. Women, again, you know, other layers that I don't even begin to understand. Um, but um, that he delights in you that he pursues you with relentless affection such that out of that you can give the amazing all of your beauty and you know that that we we do um, not see ourselves the way he sees us um, so uh out of it's only out of that place of uh, assurance based on rest um play and delight uh, that um, that I can do what uh, I do in terms of um, even looking into the face of um, of sex trafficking and, and human trafficking and the trauma uh, that um, and not just sex trafficking you know as I said whatever trauma we are all um, exposed to in our lives and, and face um, whether small or or big uh, tear fund and invader obviously combat um, and, and seek freedom in places of darkness through very specific avenues. Uh, through Tear Fund Child Sponsorship, we prevent children from ever being sold. 
And I know of uh, two stories in particular where, where um, children were targeted, they were um, taken, but because of the relationship that local tier fund partners had in those communities, they were able to get those children back. Uh, but the main, the main uh, goal of, well, no, not the main, one of the, one of the tremendous outcomes, obviously there's poverty alleviation, education, all sorts of, uh, there's life, uh, full stop, but um, from our perspective, from Invader's perspective, it's preventing children from being trafficked in the first place because it reduces the vulnerability. Uh, then you have uh, Invader, our organisation, partnering with Tier Funds so that we can, where, where women and children are trafficked, we can get evidence. Because again, you can... You can go in and you can be like the BBC and you can say this is terrible and make a documentary and shame the local authorities and make everyone aware, but, but nothing changes for those women and children. Uh, that's sometimes essential, as are UN efforts to change laws and make governments accountable and all that sort of stuff. But we work at the grassroots of going to a brothel that's on the corner of X Street and Y Street where there's who have all been sold, they're being held against their will, and um, it's owned by this person and this person. This corrupt official is protecting the business, and we're going to get evidence, damning evidence, that under local law can be used in a local judicial system to prosecute. So we're not imposing any Western-imposed morality. We're saying, here's the evidence. Here's your law in Thailand or Burma or Laos or Malaysia, wherever it is. Um, uh, how can we help you? In the, in the case of the local police who are invariably corrupt, how can we help you guys look good? You know, here's a bottle of something to drink on the side, and, and but basically, how can we make you guys look good? Uh, do the right thing. We don't want the glory. We just want these women and children out, and and they love it. They they get to take uh, evidence that they would never have um, gathered or could gather on their own, and uh, they they're on the front page of the paper because you know the local guy gets promoted, um, and. Crucially for us too, for every person that's imprisoned, uh, conservatively for a trafficker to go to uh, jail, that's 24 women a year who will not be trafficked while they're in jail. So if someone's in jail for 10 years, you know, that's 10 times 24, and some of the and that's conservative, so some of the sentences are up to 25 years, uh, and you, magn you magnify that by the number of people. Um, and then you have... Um, so there's prevention, there's intervention, and then you've got the aftercare groups that uh, Tier Fund works with, like Hagar and um, Sharon Care, who again, uh, ours is the exciting, glamorous, you know, kick the door in, FBI, James Bondy work, but the, the real heroes are the ones who, um, who, who do the long, painful journey with those women and children who have to bring them back out of darkness uh, and earn, uh, rebuild and earn their, their trust and, um, you know, the most uh, traumatic thing for me, or one of the most traumatic things, was, was looking into the eyes of these little girls and just seeing nothing. Just complete um, zombies. Just complete death. And, uh, and so the after, these amazing aftercare groups do the, do the work of bringing the life back. And uh, it's amazing to, to see. Um, I think it was Martin Luther King who said, um, uh, you are free, uh, and you are all, to varying degrees, certainly by right of uh, being here today in, in uh, Walkworth, New Zealand, you are free. The, uh, the question, the challenge, or the invitation is, what will you do with your freedom? What will you do with your freedom? Uh, and scripture would seem to support this, that you make, or, or freedom grows as you give it away. Like anything of God, uh, it grows as you as you give, which is why I said, you know, you are the most wonderful thing you can give to someone else. And as you give, as you give yourself, not in sacrificial giving, in other-centered self-giving, because you value, because you know you are of value, um, you give, and and that grows. Likewise, as you give freedom, it grows. Uh, and um, Sheena, Sharon are here from Tier Fund, so please, if, if you've got any questions of um, Project ACT, which is uh, what um, uh, the, uh, the way, the vehicle through which um, Tier Fund uh, partners with groups like Invader to, to give freedom. And it is an amazing thing to, um, to be able to do that.
Uh, it's a tragic thing that there are more people in the world crying out for freedom than ever before, um, but it is an amazing, uh, I think, opportunity to, to participate. You know, um, uh, again, um, I've heard um, various people say, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we had lived during Nazi-occupied Germany and we could have been the ones to rescue some of those Jewish people banging on our doors? Um, wouldn't it have been amazing to live in, in Mississippi and walk alongside Martin Luther King? And, um, and it's, it's interesting that when we imagine those things, we're always on the side of the ones that, are, that now, with the benefit of hindsight, can see uh, more clearly. But uh, I guess what I, when I, if I'm honest, you know, I grew up as a young boy that loved uniforms, loved uh, things military, Loved, um, you know, wanted to be a police officer, and and uh, if I had gotten in the wrong crowd, I could have been the guy with a swastika on my on my arm just because I loved the uniform. Um, and in the 19, you know, if I had been part of a Bible believing Southern Baptist church in Mississippi, I would have been the one throwing the stones and and uh, screaming at the at um, at uh, the uh, African American. Um, civil rights, you know, it's, so it's easy in hindsight. I guess what I'm saying is the opportunity today is to have 2020 vision, um, and I think it's pretty clear uh, that uh, the rape of women and children for profit is not God's will. <laughs> you can take it from me. Uh, and um, and Project Act, I, I just signal that uh, the living room downstairs is, is, is. Please come and chat with us. Chat with the tier funds. Uh, staff, because again, it's not just you and your families, but the churches of which you are a part. We will ultimately fail to effectively combat modern-day slavery unless the church, the global church, that most uh, most um, relevant for us, the New Zealand church, steps up and participates in some way. Um, so I've covered quite a few things. Uh, again, did want to make it informal as possible and, and make it two-way. Um, do you have any questions? Any? Uh, How long yes. Were you in the Twenty years. I know I don't look it, but. <laughs> what, what year did you leave? Uh, I joined in '91 and uh, left in 2000. How many years is that? No, not 91, sorry, 2001. Uh, 2001 and left in 2012. No, that's 10 years. No, sorry, I left. When did I join? No, I joined in 1993. Yeah, sorry, 1993, left in uh, 2012. Actually, sorry, it was 1992. <laughs> I can't remember. I'm... That's how old I am. No, it was 92 through 2012. Yeah, that's right. So it was a uh, 20-year period. Always in Yep. I did come up to Auckland to arrest a few baddies from Christchurch, but, yes, always in Christchurch. Um, just on a personal question, did you join the police force as a Christian, and did you have any experience of you know, direction that you were going to be involved in No. Yes. No. I um. I was. Uh, I wanted to join the police as a as a teenage boy, but my eyesight wasn't good enough. Uh, wear contact lenses, and at the time, you know, you needed to be perfect in every way, <laughs> and uh, that devastated me. So I went to university, like most young people do when they don't know what to do, and um, uh, through through a series of of meetings, um, sitting beside an attractive girl who invited me to. I could make it spiritual, but it's not. I just wanted to sit by the girl. She invited me to this meeting. Anyway, it was a Christian evangelist, and one thing led to another. And so I became a Christian at university, and then uh, heard um, uh, a guy called Tony Campolo, uh, inspirational uh, speaker, talk about a master's program that he had at a university in um, Philadelphia to train young people to go and fight injustice and po uh, and poverty, and uh, that tied in with my desire to be Batman. And so I. I uh, got a scholarship, went there, did a master's degree in, um, in third world development, how to fight poverty and injustice. Um, came back to New Zealand, really floundered uh, as to, you know, how to, because I had a degree but no experience and um, people didn't really want that. Uh, the, um, the um, you know, uh, recruiting standards, 
you could wear contact lenses basically in the police. A number of things had changed, and through a back door, I was able to to join the police. Uh, so I did. To answer your question, I was uh, a Christian when I joined the police, and my policing experience was very, very different because of that. I, I would have been a, a little Nazi, I think, if I had gone straight into the police. But um, uh, but yeah, no, I um, it was very much. And I, the, the hardest thing about policing for me was never the work; it was the culture. Uh, you know, in '92 when I joined, I was in the Christchurch control, police control room each night on a night shift when it went, you know, the phones went quiet and uh, my job was to answer the 111 calls basically. Uh, they would bring pornography into the um, into the control room and so I'm sitting there supposed to be answering calls from women who have been raped potentially, watching porn. I mean, that was the that was the culture back in the. Yes, it is, yeah. Well, uh, there is, um, we were talking about this after my earlier session, uh, that question about, you know, pedophiles, and I um, I basically, because of time, but I wanted to say that, that yeah, it's not, this isn't a pedophile problem, this is a male problem, and, uh, and um, yeah, it is challenging when you think that between 50 and 80% of men in churches are struggling Yes, which is for me why I come back to assurance because the same applies to men, uh, right? I mean, for, for me, men, um, uh, you know, they're so um, enslaved, them, you know, outright pornographic addiction uh, or sex addiction or, you know, whatever, whether that's even a real thing, but, um, uh, but in, in slavery of some form uh, because, again, they, they, they don't know that they're enough. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of great programs. You know, there's um, the Triple X Church and there's uh, Valiant Man. Um, there's, Valiant Man's a great course for for men who want to explore um, their sexuality and a you know group of men getting together and it's it's great. Uh, but again, it's it's just another program. <coughs> uh, and unless um, that's why you know I chose to to speak to this because. Um, for me, it comes back to our theology, actually, in the church. That it's just another thing that men have to do, and you know, it's just another source of shame, actually, um, if it's not done well. Sorry, you were going to say something. Yes, maybe. Um, I spoke at Promise Keepers last year and, and they wanted me to, to say, to make that link, to make men aware that, that, it, that it is all connected, that men in New Zealand watching pornography drives the sex industry which fuels the trafficking of women and children overseas. So it's not a harmless, benign activity in, the, in your bedroom um, uh, in the hope that it would shame them to stopping. And, and I just said, um, uh, no. I mean, I did speak, but I said I won't. Shame has never worked as a basis upon which to, to change behaviour. And if anything, it only further condemns and makes it secret and is just another toxic layer. I said, but I will talk about relationship and assurance. And I said, what I said at the Auckland Conference was, um, religion would have me say to you, you know, after pointing out this link, religion would have me say to you, relationship, your father who pursues you with love and affection, who longs for you to know how he sees you, would say, my son, my son, my son. I, I want, you know, I want so much more for you. you know, I don't, I, yeah, I don't want you to look at that stuff because it's just sucking the life out of you. That, um, that pornography fuels sexual dysfunction, uh, erectile dysfunction. It actually makes, you know, because I want such an amazing life in all areas, including your sex life, I don't want you to watch that stuff because it's sucking the life out of you, let alone 
the woman on the other side of the world uh, or elsewhere in our own community. Um, so for me it comes back to to have right um, relationship. I may have. Not uh, driving the demand. Uh, there are men who are, some men are trafficked, um, but the, the overwhelming numbers of men who are trafficked is for labour trafficking. Um, so they're trafficked into fishing industries, you know, rock quarries in India. Um, yeah, there are boys. If it's, if, I mean, we uh, Invader is specifically focused on combating sex trafficking. So, and actually, my very first case was um, uh, in Bangkok buying a bag, and this guy came up to me and and said, do you want girl, do you want girl? And, you know, you hear that every, every day in Bangkok as a, as a single male. Uh, and I said, no, no, no. And he said, oh, you want boy? And I said, oh, okay, and ended up going with him the next day. And, and that was my first case, just filming three boys, six, seven, and nine, who were sold to me for sex. And they were being sold every day to men, he said, from Korea and Japan. And um, So there are boys sold into the sex trafficking industry. There are also boys sold into, you know, in the Middle East, there's the jockey thing. And um, there are boys... There are boys who are trafficked, and there are men who are trafficked, but the overwhelming majority is women and children, uh, women and girls. How did you get involved in the police force? Well, yes. Uh, so I um, spent 11 years in the in the police in Christchurch, got married in that time, uh, and um, and then heard about an American organisation that used police officers basically to go to third world countries and use evidence gathering techniques and technology to fight injustice and, and slavery. And I thought, ah, oh, this was, you know, ordained. Uh, this was um, clearly the path and, and uh, I ripped the family up and took off to Washington DC and, and we lived there for four years and that's where I worked for an American group, uh, which um, was fantastic. Uh, I absolutely loved it. I was living the dream. I mean, I was James Bond. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm ashamed to say this now, but I used to walk down those long walkways, you know, those American airports, they're just massive, and people would be getting off the plane and I'd be walking down toward my plane, <laughs> just thinking if you only knew what I'm, you know. I mean, my head was out here uh, for the first two years. And then it started to destroy me because the failure the failures became more common and um, uh, and the toll um, emotionally and mentally on me um, the, the 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 insidious seduction my, my my workplace was a brothel and I would spend hours in go-go bars watching you know young woman naked dance around a pole because there was a 12 year old girl who had been trafficked there but in order to get to that 12 year old girl I've got to sit here and drink beer and talk to idiots and watch these girls and you can't do that stuff for a long period of time, pretending to be that person without it somehow affecting who you are. And and the organisation was fantastic that I worked for, but they weren't aware of any of this stuff. They were they were well-meaning, great mission statement, but had no awareness of trauma and secondary trauma and what that kind of workplace. You know, there was no support. Basically, there was no debriefing. I'd come home. I'd get off the plane from Cambodia, having had children sit on my knee. In one circumstance, I get off the plane, go with my wife to a kiddo park, children sit on my knee, and it screwed my... <laughs> uh, so it ultimately destroyed me and destroyed my marriage. Came back to New Zealand, and um, uh, the police psychologist that I went to see, well, I was back in the police, and um, he said, uh, you need to write down your thoughts. It'll be healing for you to do so, and I, I got carried away and wrote a book. Uh, God in a brothel, and then the American publisher, Intervarsity Press, said, um, you know, we'll publish it if you promote it. So I was travelling through the States, and I was just in church after church after church who said, um, you know, we're seeing women and children enslaved right outside our door, and we don't know what to do. There's more than 100,000 young women, uh, well, children actually, on the streets of the United States alone um, being sold each day, uh, let alone the Many, many thousands who were trafficked from um, Mexico and, and um, you know, Latin America up through that border, Eastern European women. Uh, and um, they said, wouldn't it be amazing if you could start something from what you have learned, albeit a costly journey, but what if you could start something that was Kiwi-based uh, and that only used best practices, that didn't send men out by themselves for months at a time, 
without support. They only used teams that had really mandatory policies, procedures in terms of mandatory care. Uh, you know, every two months I'm required, as are all our staff, to go and talk to a psychologist just to make sure that the stories we're reading, you know, whether it's the typist back in Christchurch, New Zealand, who's the, the video editor person who's watching our covert footage, just that we're, we're healthy. We're not getting caught up in, in uh, we're not, it's, um, you know, that we're dealing with it in a, in a sustainable way. So that's where Invader came from. And in our first year of operation, we realised that we were really good at investigations, but we sucked at um, fundraising, marketing, uh, awareness, and uh, and that's where our relationship with, with Tier Fund came from, because they do that really well. They have a great, a very professional partnership with the New Zealand Church, and they're great. It meant that we didn't have to spend a lot of money on and stuff, we could focus on what we were good at, and Tier Fund does event management, fundraising, marketing, and and we, you know, we're a, a symbiotic uh, team, uh, and so that's where we are, where we currently where we currently are. We have an office in Thailand. Um, I don't know if I said, but we have uh, 11, 12 staff in Thailand, and uh, four and a half in currently in, in Christchurch. Um, and the goal is with the, with the empowerment of the New Zealand Church as we empower. The church and the church empowers us that we can also op open an office in Vietnam or Myanmar or wherever the spirit leads. Sorry, that was a long answer. Are the churches in these countries, are they getting involved in helping you and doing uh, undercover work like you do? The Christian churches in like, Cambodia and Thailand and... Um, the churches, the churches are getting involved, and we, and we do have that's one of our you know our three goals are rescue, prosecution, and empowerment. And for me, the rescues and prosecutions are uh, our nuts and bolts, but it's the empowerment part of it that that is um, uh, with the church that will change culture. And um, and so yeah, there are churches that are stepping up. We because of the nature, the danger, the risk, and the skills required, we don't just let anyone do the the investigations. They can't. Um, and uh, so typically at this point it's um, Kiwis and uh, Australian investigators that um, although we have, um, sorry I take that back, we have um, uh, six Thai investigators as well but they've all come from a background of um, police or um, covert work and so yeah it's the kind of work where you can't just send but in terms of uh, awareness raising, engagement um, and uh, in time I hope uh, changing culture is the kind of stuff that, that you talked about. You know, it's, it's um, because as long as it's okay for Thai men, uh, the, the, the uh, most Thai teenage males will have their first sexual experience in a brothel. And as long as that is the case, and as long as they can to have a, um, I can't think of the name, but a, a second wife, basically. So the first wife always lives in fear of putting a line, you know, being firm and saying no, because... He's got his second wife. Anyway, there's all these cultural gender inequality. As long as it's okay for a family to want a new TV set in some cases and you know send their 15-year-old daughter off, I, mean, I, I, I have seen that, and that's, but that's not, um, not as common as a family that struggles to put food on the table. And they get to that point. You know, Again, it's easy for us to judge, but when you're the parents and you've got three kids and you get to that point where you've only got enough, enough rice for one, um, you know, the, the, I can't fathom as a as a father, um, you know, having to make that choice. So, so the church is, um, uh, but again, uh, churches are so enslaved to culture as well, uh, and and religion. Yeah. What about the thing of I don't know. Uh, I think the king's nearly. You know, he's on his last legs, I think. Um, yeah, he's quite old, but um, he's quite revered. Yes, no, well, if you know the king, <laughs> or anyone who knows the king. Yeah, it, it, yeah, that's right. No, it would be wonderful to get the level of, of support and engagement. I wondered um, yeah, how involved, what they knew and what they were... Yes, no, I don't know. Yeah, I think um, uh, the official position is Thailand is against sex trafficking, obviously. Uh, unofficially, Thailand makes millions and millions of dollars from sex tourism, and their economy would take a...
Yes, I, I do so with a proviso that I've been out of the police now for four you know, years and, and I worked church. Um, when I left I was in fraud investigation. So I, I actually don't know. Um, but um, anecdotally through through, you know, organisations like Tear Fund and others, um, hear that um uh, I mean we do have we'd be foolish to believe that it isn't here, it is in every country in the world. Uh, there are women in, in Auckland who have been trafficked here, but not just from overseas. You know, when the Rugby World Cup, there was women, uh, Kiwi girls, trafficked from Invercargill to um, Auckland for the Rugby World Cup to serve those men by gangs. Um, however, the New Zealand law says that unless they're brought across an international border and someone has the intention of trafficking them as they come, it's not trafficking. So by UN and US definitions, we absolutely have trafficking in New Zealand. By New Zealand definitions, we have had almost zero cases because our law is so outdated and difficult to prove. So it gives the authorities um, a nice place to be able to stand and say we don't have trafficking here, but actually, yeah, we do have it. Um, on our positive side is New Zealand is uh, hard to get to because of our geography. You've got to pretty much come through the airport, so we're hard to get to. Um, because of our Judeo-Christian culture, women are... Um, seen as far more uh, equal to men than, than most countries around the world. So our culture um, is against it uh, for a start. And we have not a, not a perfect but a, a largely corrupt free, in fact we're the least corrupt nation by most international standards on earth. So, you know, uh, one of the biggest things we fight in, in places like Thailand is corruption because um, we typically have to outsource we have to get a squad from. If we want to do an operation, we have to get a, a police team and bring them in ourselves and pay for their expenses to come. Because if we go to the local police, uh, there'll, be a, um, there'll be a tip off, and uh, we won't succeed. In Yeah, absolutely, and that's why I started today with, um, you know, I hate religion because it enslaves people. It puts, you know, you're either in or you're out, and if if you've been, if you're in this category, you're defiled. You're, and and to touch you will will contaminate. You know, this this warped religious view of what's holy and what's not holy, and um, you know, so I not just churches over there. It's we're victims of it here and uh, as well. We're you know, some things are more holy than others, and some we, we hear it. I don't know if, you know, I hear it because I my I'm attuned to it. But um, well, not all of it. You know, you, some of it I hear some of it, but it, it fills our vocabulary. You know, that God wants to use you. Um, uh, you know, uh, we were introduced as um, as full time Christian professionals. What does that mean? Um, <laughs> uh, well. I would run from that a million miles, you know, that, um, that uh, you know, when the curtain was torn, uh, there's no different, everything matters. Uh, caring for your child at home is a full-time Christian profession, you know, it's, um, there's no distinction between what's, that's why I shied away from equipping the saints for ministry, I mean, what we, whether you clean gutters, paint walls, care for children at home, or a pastor of a, a large church, it's all ministry. It all matters. I'm changing the subject a bit, but I was a bit intrigued. Probably should, because I'll <laughs> get in trouble. No, I was intrigued with what you said about the way you got um, the process. When you were doing investigations and you appealed to the people with power and so that they benefited and looked good, is that still the way? The, the reason I'm asking is I work in advocate, activist, in a sense for a marginalised community of people in New Zealand, disabled people, mm. and that's exactly the strategy I use with mm. councils to try, because we are naturally included in mainstream services, yeah. and I was just intrigued to hear that you used a similar approach. Is that still how you work? 
I think it's our strength as Invader, as Kiwis. I mean, the, the American group used to call me the genius, not because I, I, you know, the James Bond in me would think I was something special, but actually it was because I was a Kiwi. And uh, we, we're, we're, as I say, we're egalitarian, practical, uh, we're self-effacing, we just want to get the job done, we don't have an ego necessarily, you know, um, we, we, um, we're, uh, we use ingenuity, uh, least corrupt nation, you know, all that thing, all those things together mean that, um, uh, oh, and we're well liked. So in many cultures, especially Southeast Asia and the Pacific, so if I've got some evidence and I come to you in the police force and I walk in in my you know, FBI-looking suit and I've got a professional folder here, um, I can do it and I can slam it on your desk and condemn you for being such a you know, corrupt, hopeless, inept cop, or I can come with great you know, Kiwi cultural respect and um, communicate that in the way that I um, you know, talk to you and revere you and um, there's also that police police thing. We can say, oh well, you know, I know how hard it is um, being there myself. So it's really just building relationship again. It comes down to relationship. So when we have those little girls that need to be rescued, and I call that police officer, he won't do it because it's his job. He'll do it because, ah, oh, Mr. Daniel, da 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 da, and and because we have relationship. And it's- Relationships, and uh, and then I'd invite. I mean, nothing against um, uh, Americans. Married uh, an American. <laughs> uh, I love Americans, <clears throat> but uh, uh, relationship. Give it to one of my American cop, and so again they have that classic, you know, personality. But they'd come in and say, right, you know, nice to meet you. We want da da da. We want da da da. And this, and in, you know, especially in Asia, the relationship is everything. So you've actually got to put that aside and. Yeah, you want the little girls rescued, but in order to do it, as you say, you've got to ask about their family. You know, if necessary, go and have a beer with them at a local bar, um, build that relationship, meet their wife, and um, and uh, and bec- then because you've got that relationship, they will once they've got that loyalty, and you know that you're in their court and they're in yours. Oh, they told me all sorts of things that. Um, you know, one police commander told me, he said, oh, we had a problem here with the mafia a few years ago, but one night we just kidnapped the two leaders and we shot them over there and threw their bodies in the... We don't have a problem anymore, you know. <laughs> and, um... Uh, I think it's a, a Kiwi strength in the way that we work, you know, that um, that uh, the Americans have struggled and... South, the American group I uh, used to work for was actually kicked out of Thailand because they shamed and embarrassed the local authorities by... They were zealous and passionate, but just the way they went about it. Um, and uh, whereas Invader, just having... You know, there's an Auckland lawyer who runs our team over there, and, and he's just really good at doing what Kiwis do best. You know, yeah, respect and honour. Even though you don't like a lot of what's going on, you, it's not our country, it's not our culture... Oh, I think it's... Uh, oh, yes, the growth, um, the, it's always been here uh, since Adam. But um, but you're right, there are certain things, and I talk about those in, in the book, God in a Brothel. Uh, we've got a dangerous concoction that's with the ease of modern uh, communities. Uh, you know, you add that to the porn industry. Um, um, oh, I wrote it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the internet, international travel, sex tourism... Uh, globalisation, you know, the merging of, of global cultures, um, uh, corruption, uh, so there's, and male uh, corporate, um, corporate pedophilia, you know, massive corporations making money off the sexualisation and objectification of women. Many of the magazines that you may all enjoy are actually part of the problem. You know, you walk past those counters in the supermarkets and they all communicate one thing about a woman's body, um, and men walk through those counters and they are picking up that same stuff and everybody's happy with it, so it must be fine. Um, but it all feeds this, the, the lens through which we see the world. Uh, so you're right, it, it's always been here, but in the last, um, because of all those factors, it's now the fastest growing crime in the world. You're in criminal groups more than 99 billion US dollars a year. 
uh, and it's going to surpass the drug trade because drugs you can only use once and they're gone, but girls, boys, you can use many times. Um. Well, I think the parents, I know they're poor and they sell their children. Not, not always. No, I, I, I probably, um, I, uh, I should be more careful. I should. I need to try not to use the word should. I want to be more careful in using that example uh, with caution. Um, the majority are, um, uh, have cult different cultural values, for sure, but the majority are vulnerable. And they're vulnerable in large part due to poverty. And... Um, yeah, the overwhelming majority don't want to see their children sold, and and in some cases they're not sold either. They're they're actually de uh, they're deceived. Um, and I tell you the story that I told the the young people earlier of uh, of a girl called Esther, Christian family uh, in Myanmar, lovely family, brought up their daughter, um, uh, then going on 16, and the auntie, trusted auntie, lovely auntie, came and said there was a job she could get Esther in. Northern Thailand should be able to send money home and help the really struggling, uh, poor, poor farming family. So the parents said yes. Esther went with the auntie. The auntie took her straight to a brothel, uh, sold Esther as a virgin for a lot of money. Esther was locked up for two weeks um, until the manager could find a, a buyer to rape a virgin. Sadly, she was then raped, and then she was put out with all the other girls and, and raped continuously for, for many months. And um, in Esther's case, she, she had her Bible, uh, and um, when she wasn't being raped uh, for profit, she was, um, she was praying, she was reading. And the other girls used to mock her and say, your God has forgotten you. And uh, one of my colleagues, um, several months later, was, was able to infiltrate that place and gathered, was able to speak to Esther and, and uh, gathered evidence of the crime uh, the police came and, and rescued her, and uh, when the team went back with her to collect her belongings, they noticed this writing above her bed, and um, they said, Esther, what's that, um, what's that writing? And she said, it's Psalm 27, and it says, The Lord is my light and the stronghold of my life. When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, even then I will trust in you. Wow. Which brings me right back to what I began with at the beginning because in my mind uh, Esther was certainly physically enslaved but, um, but because she rested each day in the relentless affection and delight of the Father she was free. She was free no matter what was going on around her and I suppose that's what I um, have found to be true. What happened to the uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but Esther was rescued. Esther was repatriated with her family and uh, ultimately travelled America uh, telling her story, um, empowering churches with um, not just awareness and the fight, the invitation, you know, to join uh, Tear Fund and so on, uh, groups like Tear Fund and Vader, but, but actually of a deeper invitation to a level of freedom that is based on relationship, not religion. Yes, for such a time. Mm. Yeah, the, the challenge in in uh, the ch always the challenge, you know, um, Sheena from Tierfun over here, my partner, uh, uh, partner in crime, said. Um, uh, she said today, or well, reminded me, you know that, um, and I don't know. If Sam can speak to this, perhaps, but uh, you know, when you're when you're in this world every day, it's easy to talk about, and you forget how confrontational it can be. But that's always the challenge: is how to speak about the unspeakable. And I don't know how to fully communicate to you what is going on in terms of children. Uh, um, we're partner with an organisation in India, for example, that um, rescues uh, children. They, they go about it in a way that we don't necessarily agree with because they buy them. Uh, and, you know, in, in short term it, it's great because you, you're getting those kids out, but you're fueling the industry by... Anyway, that's potentially a relationship that we can help with because they don't have the ability to gather evidence to prosecute, and so they're buying 
but they're buying them by the hundreds. And they are, in every case, almost in every case, they are street kids who are already abandoned, abandoned, who who are just being snatched. And um, and he was recounting the story of one of these children that he, actually he was a, an Indian man. Um, went to Japan, worked for IBM or someone like that, and he was standing around the uh, drinking fountain in this uh, tower in Tokyo listening to two his Japanese colleagues talk about this trip they just had back to India where they had bought and used and then discarded these two little girls. And he, he couldn't believe it because this is his homeland, surely not India. He got some details, went back, and just out of fascination he went back and he met this person who was sitting on this barrel uh, at the time, and he asked him, and he jumped off the barrel and pulled out this little girl by here and said, "Yep, here's, you know, how much do you want?" And it wasn't just to buy. Like I've only experienced buying for an hour or a night. This was to buy outright, and then, um, and I could sh- I could share more. But the the danger in doing so is that you become uh, is that it is confrontational, and um, I, I suppose the invitation. Uh, certainly to be uh to be honest and authentic and genuine about the state of the world <laughs> uh because that is that is the truth that's the reality but that's also why uh we are the most dangerous force for good sitting on the knee of the father from that place of assurance with assurance running through our veins we are dangerous and the invitation to the New Zealand church, to each of you individually, for your families, but your churches, your communities, is to live out that uh, we, that we are. If once we see ourselves through his eyes, with assurance running through our veins, we are dangerous beyond measure. We are unstoppable. That would silence the voice of the accused and not listen to his definition of who we are with all of our, I am not, so I'm not this, I'm not that, but actually... Uh, in that place of assurance, um, partner with with TFR New Zealand and um, and set people free. And in, in the last uh, two years, um, between 150 and 160 women and children that have that we have set free. Uh, and between uh, I don't know the numbers in the last couple of months, uh, between 50 and 60 prosecutions. That will mean that several thousand women and children will now not be trafficked because. Because the New Zealand Church, through funds, uh, and I think that's really exciting and, and a place of hope and uh, something to celebrate. Yes. Uh, in some cases, in every case is different, you know, and that, that's our goal is not just to put one or two in jail, but um, we have a, a team that's focused on organised crime, so um, it's not just to shut down the brothel and get the brothel manager, but to shut down the brothel, the manager, his traffickers, the people at the border, um, the recruiters, and actually to shut down that whole particular network, that chain. Um, and it, obviously because of corruption, that's harder than it sounds. Uh, but that's, that's, that was the original vision, <laughs> and that's the goal. Um, but to do so in conjunction with changing culture, because as you say, if as long as men think it's their right, uh, and that it's natural for a you know family in northern Thailand who can't uh, feed their their girls to send the the uh, the oldest down to um, to be, to Bangkok to be uh, to be sold as a as a slave, and as long as Kiwi men think it's okay to take a rugby trip and go there and use those girls, um, you know, until all of that is uh, challenged, then yes, you're, the answer is yes. There will always be more men to replace the. The rugby team members were they all from the Uh, you get a bunch of uh, bunch of males, no matter what culture they're from, and they've had a few beers, and and you know it's pretty hard to tell sometimes with makeup and and gender and uh, not uh, sorry with with age. I found it really hard pretending to be drunk, but actually stone cold sober, looking and trying to assess because they're you know Filipino women, for example, they're they're slight, they're, and sometimes I'd be like, you know. And, and one called the best girl, she turned out to be you know 18 and of age, but I thought she was 12. Um, and it's really hard to tell 
anyway, that's not an excuse. Um, I don't think when you're drunk and with a bunch of guys, I don't think you really care. Um, so, uh, um, again, the, the <laughs> heavy, heavy heaviness in the room, uh, and and perhaps that's to be, um, and perhaps that's appropriate, uh, which is why. <laughs> I uh, I come back to why, um, you know, for me, what I said at the outset, because otherwise it's not sustainable. Um, You know, how do you equip the saints? Um, Or as I said, uh, I think the more appropriate challenge is, if it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, how do we live into and live out of that freedom? In a world of slavery... Not just literal slavery, but slavery within our culture and within our, our gender and our church and our own country. How do we live into what it means to be fully free? That freedom is an incremental process inside a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and that the most dangerous crime-stopping people on earth are those who have assurance running through their veins. And we get that assurance through rest sitting on the Father's knee. I mean, some of you may want to, after this, go and sit on his knee like I've done in the last couple of weeks and and just cry and actually swear a lot. (laughs) Uh, I took the paint off my wall the other day because I threw my Bible against it. uh, (laughs) uh, And I think he likes that. I think he, um, you know, one of the worst times of my life when I was going through uh, marriage falling apart on the back of Christian mission, burning myself out on Christian mission. I went to New Brighton Beach in Christchurch and I I let him have it with tears and swear words and everything I could have. And all I was spent and I said, why do you hate me so much? Uh, and the curtain parted. You know, we see through a glass darkly. Well, for a moment that glass... Uh, the, it, and I just it, and it, one of the worst days, but also the best, one of the best in my life. And that I just, in some way, you know, the the heroes of the Old Testament were all broken, screwed up, messed up, killers and adulterers and uh, um, people. But um, when it came to talking to God, they said it like it was, and they called him an asshole when he, did, you know, when they perceived it that way, and they weren't ashamed. And we get so religious about and dance around him as this deity that. I think the most magnificent moments I've had, and, and I, as I say, even in the last painful couple of uh, uh, months and weeks, uh, that it's actually that authenticity of, uh, and then I find the assurance flows through my veins um, when he lets me see myself as, as he sees me, on his knee, not me pursuing in or pressing into God and any other religious BS, but resting in him as he pursues me. Uh, playing the great dance, Baxter Kruger, an amazing book. He talks about it, that that, that we are invited actually to the great dance. is about dancing with the Spirit in the midst of all the stuff we've been talking about. And uh, and finally, um, delight. Uh, Delighting in him and, uh, you know, again, him delighting in us. Uh, We we wear it like a badge in, in Christian world. You know, well, do you love the Lord? Oh, you know, my children love the Lord. And, you know, as if, well, I've been successful as a parent because my kids love the Lord. <laughs> um, what I want my kids to know is that he loves them. Even when they forget it. And even when they mess up and crash and burn. Um, and uh, that's what I hope for all of you. Hey, thank you for coming. It's, I know it's been a, a hard thing to, to hear. If, if uh, the conversation is today... I. Um, I'm the Glenn Nars, but I, um, you know, statistically, some of you will have had your own trauma in various forms. And all I say is if um, anything that we've talked about today has um, brought that to the surface, uh, there are multitudes of people here full of love and compassion and grace. Um, you know, the TFN team myself uh, are available, but please, um, you know, don't, don't spend another day a slave to any of that stuff. Um, bring it to the light and um, and be free. Tiafun's uh, living room is uh, underneath us and down the down the other end of the building. So uh, please um, come and hunt them out and 
Um, 